15 uh, or 20 minutes, and then we go into the foot washing. Let us bow our heads. Lord, I pray you will be with me and hide me behind the cross of Jesus, that I may speak clearly, that you will ready the hearts of your people in the name of Jesus. Amen. Justice has read the scripture. The choir has sung wonderfully to the glory of God. You've been singing wonderfully as well. The music is exquisite. Um, Brother Cortes plays the piano, and uh, the way he plays it would uh, compel us to sing even more. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, Paul wrote to this to the Philippians. The church at Philippi was the first Christian church in Europe, planted by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey in around AD 50 or 51. And the initial converts in the church at Philippi were actually Gentiles. They were not Jews, but Gentiles. And the congregation developed into a predominantly Gentile worshipers. Uh, when Paul wrote this, he was in prison already. He wrote this to the church at Philippi, and the church at Philippi was commendable in many, many things and for several reasons. However, they were also dealing with some disunity among this. And so he started by saying, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, Christianity is the changing and the renewing of our minds. If you do Christianity simply on the level of behavior and the external behavior, then probably you are in the wrong place. You've got to change first your mind. You've got to renew your mind because the behavior that follows after that must be coming from the renewing of your mind, first and foremost. And so, we must fill our minds with God's Word. As Jesus prayed His longest prayer in John chapter 17, He says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. John 17, verse 17. And then He says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The way Paul wrote it and the words he used denotes the continuance of a previous state of existence, particularly in his illustration or in his description of who, God, who Jesus is. First, he uses the word being. It's huparkon in the original language. means Jesus was innately, naturally God. In essence, God being God, originally God. So, and then he says, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, meaning though he's in pre-incarnate state, he possessed the essential qualities of God. He did not consider his status of divine equality a price to be selfishly hoarded. Now, a rubber, he, he's using the word robbery here, a rubber wants to grab and get as much money and wealth as he could. A robber would risk his life so he could just grab anything that is valuable. That's the language of Paul here. And so Paul is saying Jesus is in being and in essence God. But he did not cling to it or grab it like a robber would. Paul here is actually depicting the attitude and the character of Jesus in contrast with the character of Lucifer at the very beginning. If you remember Lucifer, 
He wants to be above God. And actually, not just sitting as God, but really above God and God under him. If you remember the temptation of Jesus, he wants God to worship him. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And so this is the humility of Jesus. Not my humility, not yours. This is Jesus. Now, you know the story of Jesus, the historical Jesus, his birth so lowly, only among the animals. We parents, our ladies, gave birth in the hospital or at home. I was born at home. And there was only a midwife who came in to help my mother give birth to me. And what was the price for doing that to the midwife? Well, just one chicken and give it to, to the midwife. Now, he lived in an obscure village. Our cul-de-sac, or our neighborhood, is a lot better than his. He worked as an assistant in a small-time carpenter shop of his human father until he was the age of 30. If you were born in this country and you are 30 years old, you probably are driving your own car or you are on a transport on your way to work. You smell good. You look fresh. You have a bank account to your name. You have a home to go home to. Go home to. But Jesus, foxes have holes, Birds have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. Now, for three and a half years, he became a wandering preacher. He never owned a home of his own. He did not have any office. He never went to college or uni. He never traveled far. He had no credentials by himself. The best ride he had was not a golden chariot or a white horse. His best ride was on a lowly donkey. Now today, young people would like to have a sports car if they have to choose as their first car. Dad, when am I going to drive? 16 or 17? I think it's 17 here in this country. And then they have the aspiration to change the alloy wheels. Probably remap the ECU for more torque and horsepower. Sometimes they change the exhaust so that when they drive, it goes broom broom to make it a head turner. But Jesus, this is his triumphant entry. When it is a triumphant entry, it is a declaration, it is a pronoun pronouncement that I am victorious. And actually, he was sung as being the king. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. That's the song and that's the shout that he gave to him. It was not a horse. And white horse normally is what the general would ride coming from battle, going into a triumphant entry back to the city because that means horse and white means the general has been victorious. Jesus is victorious in a triumphant entry, pronounced as king of Israel, pronounced as Hosanna, but on a lowly donkey. And that donkey was not even his. It was only borrowed. And shortly after this seemingly successful triumphant entry of Jesus comes what is seen as an embarrassing, shocking, shameful defeat. Hung on the cross. Now where are the people who shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. They are now shouting, crucify You know, from the 6th century B.C. to the 4th century A.D., 
Crucifixion was a form of capital punishment, the most humiliating form. It is applied to those who are very low status in society and for those who are the vilest of criminals. No Roman citizen could ever be crucified on the cross. It's far too low for a Roman citizen to be crucified on the cross. Now listen to this. Although artists have traditionally drawn or depicted the figure of Jesus on the cross with a loin cloth to cover his genitals because the artist could not portray Jesus all naked. They want to put some dignity on the Savior of the world. But let me tell you this, historically, nobody, nobody ever wears any clothing when that somebody is crucified on the cross. And so your Savior and my Savior is stripped of any dignity there is. And he had to go through that for you and for me. With all these sadness and grim, as if the devil was, has really won the battle. The devil has inflicted pain, the most excruciating pain, where it involves the stripping of his dignity, rejection, abandonment, and betrayal. And physically painful as it can be, actually the emotional pain he felt was extraordinary. Where for the very first time ever, the son is separated from the Father. And you can understand that in his cry, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says, Therefore my Father loves me because I laid down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Christ is very emphatic here in this message to the reader. No reader can miss it. He said it twice. I lay down my life that I may take it back again. I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. So this biblical evidence is explicit of three things. He voluntarily, by his divine power, died for the sake of you and me. And secondly, God, no one has the power to kill God, except that he voluntarily laid down himself. And thirdly, God the Son, has the power to raise himself up from the dead. That is mind-boggling. How can a dead person raise himself? But he declared that one. Now, if we can understand that, then probably we are gods already. It sounds like an oxymoron. How can a totally dead person raise himself from the dead? But that's what God's son says. He could be totally dead, and yet he had the power to raise himself back to life again. Now, that is outside of the box uh, of our human thinking. And so, if you remember, he says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. He was not talking about the temple. He was talking about his body. And so, the Jews said, it has, been, it, it has uh, taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus has said. So the whole person of the God man Christ was dead, and he raised himself up from the dead while he was dead. That's just unbelievable. 
Now, it sounds impossible for human logic, but with God, Christ Jesus, nothing is impossible. But here is the question before we wash our feet. It's been 15 minutes now. Before we go to wash our feet, here's the question that I would like to bring it to you as you wash each other's feet. Why not? Why not after Jesus' resurrection? Why didn't he go back to the temple or to the streets to appear to everyone to be seen by all? Why only choose to appear to his followers, like 150? Why didn't he appear in the midst of the temple and prove to the people during their worship in a setting, a gathering like this, and say, look at me, I am raised from the dead. When that high priest, you know, that self-righteous Caiaphas, delivers his sermon in the temple amongst all the people, why didn't he interrupt that service during that ceremony and show the people his hands and his feet? Why didn't Jesus tell that he is the truth and the rest of them are all wrong. Why didn't he humiliate all the Pharisees and all the church leaders and all the people who shouted, crucify him? He is powerful. He could have gathered all those who caused his death in one place, in a big arena, where all the people in entire Palestine could see him. And that he could have shown himself to all people and not just to Thomas to show his pierced hand and feet and his side, he could have performed one, grand, one more grand miracle in front of them. Perhaps if I was Jesus, I'm going to go to Caiaphas and bring him down from the pulpit and then in the center of the people, and I'm going to turn Caiaphas into a frog and then turn him into a donkey and then turn him into a man, but a leprous man in front of everybody. And when I do that, I feel justified. So that when they see that uh, this is the truth, people will rush and rip Caiaphas apart and show him that uh, he is... He is false, and I will feel justified and vindicated. After my resurrection, if I were Jesus, I will appear to Herod and Pilate, and these Roman readers, I will ask them to wash my feet and bow down to me. I certainly could do that because I have passed every test. I am approved and loved by my Father. I have all the authority in heaven and on earth. I have finished my mission as to why I came to earth. I am God. I am all-powerful. I could demand anything from anyone. And that Caiaphas beside Jesus, by comparison and contrast, is only like a little insect that Jesus could just flick out with his finger and he's gone. He has the power to do that. And Jesus could have made his resurrection so grand that when he was resurrected, everybody in Israel, there is a trumpet call, there's a shout, there are lightning and thunder, and everyone will wake up and see Jesus in his splendor and glory. And there is no need then for followers to testify about the resurrected Jesus. Think about that. That's the humility of Jesus. Even in his triumph, even in his success, he remained humble. And exactly that's how you win pride. That's how you dismantle pride. You don't win pride with pride. You don't win arrogance against arrogance. You don't win another person who is so prideful and boastful with another pride and arrogance of yourself as well. You only defeat sin by righteousness. You only defeat pride with Christ's humility. And he did that to secure your salvation and my salvation. You wouldn't be here today had it not been 
for that humility of Jesus. You see, God's ways are not our ways. We human beings operate carnally. God's ways are above our ways. God is not controlled by animosity, hate, or revenge. His wisdom is above human calculations and methods. He doesn't need arrogance to confront arrogance. And any seeker of truth would see that he is who he claimed he is. And so he left a room for witnesses. He left the opportunity for his followers to testify of him. He left a room for faith. And Jesus is not a one-man band. He wants you to be involved in this. He wants you to be involved because just as you share others to others, Jesus, it will not just change others, it will tremendously change you forever. This is the reason why you and I are here today. Again, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. May the Lord bless his word. At this time, <clears throat> we're going to wash each other's feet. So there is still a room for the couples. The children would still remain in their room. The ladies would be in this room there where, where the youth are. But the men, the gentlemen, would go outside. There is a tent there. It's a lovely weather outside. The men would, would go there. Let us bow our heads as we separate. Father, thank you for Jesus, your son. May we contemplate on what he did for us. May we change our minds like the mind of Christ. May we wash each other's feet with humility and vividly reenact those times when you wash your disciples' feet. Thank you for Jesus.